so much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is the Mr. Media Interview, sponsored by the new true crime thriller, The Profiler, by Pat Brown and yours truly, coming to bookstores everywhere on May 18th, 2010 from Hyperion, and recorded live from the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. Okay, this is going to take a minute. It was the last day of our first family vacation in two years, and the three of us were unwinding in the enormous Barnes & Noble Barnes & Noble Barnes & Noble bookstore in Burlington, Vermont. My 13-year-old daughter Rachel found two young adult novels she wanted to buy, both of which her girlfriends had already read and enjoyed. The first was The Lightning Thief by Rick Warden. Uh, Reardon, pardon me, Rick, uh, which looked like it was cast in the mode of the Harry Potter books, a series that Rachel has read over and over and over. The second was a dark and somewhat frightening-looking book titled Wake by Lisa McMahon. It's subtitled, Your Dreams Are Not Your Own. I was dubious. My daughter finds the sight of blood unsettling and isn't a fan of violence or, or gore. But it was technically age-appropriate, and it meant reading something other than texts on her phone. So, okay. Well, she loved both books and consumed them in the next two days. Um, back home, a few days later, she came over to my desk, holding Wake, and asked, What's your agent's name? I said, Michael Barrett. With a triumphant look in her eyes, she pushed Wake in front of me, open to the acknowledgments page. I read it and smiled. Warmest gratitude to my fantastic agent, Michael Barrett, who believed in Janie and me. Small world. <laughs> this week, Gone, the third and final book in the Wake trilogy, completing the adventures of teenage dream catcher Janie Hannigan, hits the shelves of bookstores everywhere. It's quite a wild ride. Lisa McMahon, welcome to Mr. Media. Hey, Bob. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Great. It's great to, to uh, finally talk to you at long last. Yeah, we've been uh, we've been exchanging some email the last uh, last month or so. Uh, how you doing? Great, really great. You know, just hanging out here in Arizona, and just like you know the people in Florida, we all we do is hang out by the pool and you know have little fruity drinks. So yeah, that's <laughs> what we're doing today. <laughs> good, good way to pass the time. Um, right. And you're getting now you're getting ready to go on tour, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm very excited about my tour. It starts um, next Tuesday. And where uh, where will this take you? Well, um, I've got about I think I've got 16 stops. So mostly um, we're going to be hitting uh, some Arizona cities, moving on to California, just Southern California, and then St. Louis, Atlanta, um, Southern half of Florida, Tampa area. Um, going up to Cincinnati and Dayton, and then Toronto, and that's the end. It's amazing how you've memorized that list. I know. I've got it in my head pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, and I, by the way, before you get uh, too possessive of our friend, Mr. Barrett, let me just warn you, as I did <laughs> Sarah Zarr and James Dashner on this show before you, he was my agent first. I know. I know. You always get that claim. And it's not fair. <laughs> well, you, you seem to be making good use of the guy, so we'll let it go for now. <laughs> okay, good. Well, I, good. Uh, listen, Lisa, um, Rachel is in school as we record this, but since she's the reason that you're here, I gave her uh, the first question. So uh, awesome. let's let's talk let's talk about the books. Uh, Rachel wants to know how did you how did you first get the idea for Wake, and did it come to you in a dream? It did actually. Um, I got the. I keep a little notepad by my bed, which everyone should do, and, and a little pen. And I, whenever I have weird dreams or I wake up in the middle of the night after a dream, I try and write down a few things because you never know when you can use those things. Um, and this time, I had a dream that I was in my husband's dream, watching what he was dreaming about. And I woke up and I thought, Gosh, that's kind of a cool idea. And usually, you know, you wake up in the morning and you read what you wrote and you're like, that was so dumb. What was I thinking? But this time, the idea actually sounded kind of good. Like, 
this could actually be something. So I spent <laughs> about a month <laughs> um, thinking about Janie and, and who this character would be and what would she be like and what would the actual being able to see other people's dreams, you know, what would the rules of that world be? And uh, after thinking about it for about about a month, I just started writing, and then I couldn't stop. So it was, it was a fun ride. <laughs> now, were you already writing at that time? Yeah. Um, I was actually, at that time, querying for a different novel, which uh, I think I probably got close to 70 uh, rejections on. Um, very proud <laughs> <Man>. of those. <laughs> But, you know, as all good writers, you when you're working on something and trying to get something published, you're continuing to work on other things. And so um, by the time I finished Wake, uh, I was pretty much done querying for that first novel. And, you know, I think it still has potential of doing something someday. But I was ready to move on, and, um, and uh, within a week, uh, I had... At an agent, I had Michael, so that was just a dream come true. It's uh, it's quite a story uh, in in terms of the the book, the the first book, uh, Wake, um, and it, it I, I had a I had a guy on a couple of weeks ago, a guy named Richard Deutsch, who's written a, a new novel uh, called The Thirteenth Hour, and the, the, both of them hit me the same way. It's like just when you think no one can surprise you with a, a story or a way of telling a story. Uh, this one really does. It's different. I mean, you're, you've got a character who can get into other people's dreams and uh, not only see them, but, you know, she she develops that ability over time. Yeah, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting because I, I was really hard on her. You know, she's she's not only got this problem that she can't tell anybody about because, of course, they'd think she's a freak, but she also has a tough home life, and um, you know, she has to she has to survive. If she's going to get through this, she has to figure out how to do it all on her own. Um, so, yeah, we she's she's got this ability that she's got to try and figure out how she can control a little bit. I don't want to give too much away, but she she does find out uh, that she's not the only one on the planet who has this at some point, mm-hmm. and uh, that that that's an interesting twist. And there's some other things. Um, did did you intend? Um, uh, I'm going to guess the answer is no. But did you intend this to be a trilogy when you started, or when did when did the decision come to make make it uh, three books? Well, when I finished writing Wake, I almost immediately started writing Fade um, because and I, and I know that that's not always the best thing to do when you're writing something. You know, you don't want to write a whole bunch of books in a series because if the first one never gets published, then right. of course the next ones won't either. But, and I knew that going in. So I thought, okay, I feel like the story isn't finished. So I'm going to just write this for me. And if nothing happens, I'll be okay. And, um, so I started writing Fade immediately, and I thought, you know, there could be more. And I think there are some questions that remain unanswered in Fade. And when we got to the point where Wake was out um, for sale, then um, my my editor and I at Simon & Schuster started talking about how much we saw in the future for Janie. And we decided, we we thought it was probably just one more book. We didn't want to turn it into some sort of Nancy Drew series kind of thing, you mm. know, where where the focus was on mysteries or something like that. We wanted it to be about Janie, and her story really um, comes to, a, I think, a, a satisfying conclusion in the, the third book. So that's where we're leaving it. So uh, are you, will you be closing the, 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 the door on Janie with the third book? Have you closed the door? Well, that's so harsh. <laughs> well, I don't mean it's closing she, the door, she, she slamming in the face. I mean, <laughs> I think we're done. Oh, okay. I, I really do. I think we're done with Janie. I think I can feel like, as the author, I can feel like um, Janie can go on and, and live out the rest of her life without me, and she'll be okay. So. All right. <laughs> That's how I like to think of it. 
<laughs> I got it. Now, in the uh, what was I going to say? In, in the, the first book, it's this wicked wild ride. I mean, it, 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 Janie bounces from dream to dream. Sometimes the same people, sometimes different people. In a lot of cases, there's this one teen angst-filled moment after the other. There's it's day and night too, which people will find I think particularly interesting. Um, do you, you you obviously uh, you dream this book, but do you dream this vividly yourself, or are you blessed with that active an imagination? <laughs> um, I dream. I'm pretty. I'm a pretty vivid dreamer, I would say. Um, and a few of the dreams that I that sort of haunted me in my childhood have made it into the books. Uh, in the first book, Janie has a friend, Carrie, who has this recurring nightmare, and Janie's trying to figure it out. And Carrie never seems to remember that she dreamt it. But Janie knows all about it, and it's sort of bur- a burning question for her, like, what's going on? And that dream that Carrie has is a dream that I had, a nightmare that I had regularly as a child, and I would wake up crying every time. It was just a continuous, um, scary thing that was so real to me. But uh, that I, I put that in the book, and I think, you know, I feel like I'm sort of, Fixing myself, <laughs> mm. fixing my childhood by being able to tell the world that dream without, you know, <laughs> having to go see someone professionally for it. <laughs> <laughs> does uh, becoming a, a uh, an author and you know a best-selling author does it does it uh, lessen your dreams? I mean, are, are you or are the dream the dreams just change? You know, I think the dreams change. There's always something more to strive for. And I'm so, you know, I'm very satisfied with how my career has gone. I'm just really thrilled about it. I'm I'm amazed most of the time. Mm-hmm. And um <laughs> but, you know, there's always I and I've always been somebody who wanted to keep striving for the next thing. And, you know, so I think if you get to a point and you say, okay, I've reached my my highest goal, and, and then you just stop reaching, then, you know, you kind of start to fall backward. So mm. I feel like I've got to keep keep striving for the next things. And, and they're not always, you know, you're right. They're different, different dreams. Um I'd like to try some different kind of writing and uh, see what happens, you know. Um, I've got some different sorts of books coming out in the future, and, and we'll see what happens with those. So, Well, I'll, and I'll come back to that because I know you have a, a, a very big uh, uh, book deal that's been announced, but we'll, we'll, we'll save that for a few minutes. Um, in the books, uh, well, certainly in the first book, Janie and Cade do research on dreams, um, they, they literally, they, they're, they're high school kids that go to the library, they do research. Did you do the same thing in preparation for, for you know, writing? or? or it... I did. Uh, yeah, I totally uh, researched dreams, and I've never really, I had never really spent a lot of time thinking about dreams and why they happen and what they mean or anything like that until this book just sort of came about. And um, But once... I got into that, I started to really think, I need to know what I'm talking about here. <laughs> so I did a lot of, <laughs> yeah, it was one of those things. Uh, but uh, I did a lot of research into dreams. And, you know, I still made up some stuff myself. But some of the, the techniques that Janie uses in the book, I tried myself just to see if they would work, the lucid dreaming, trying to dream about something specific in order mm-hmm. to solve a problem. And I don't think I'm quite as successful as Janie at, as Janie at doing that, but uh, it did. I, I was able to do it, so I thought that was pretty fun. I usually, when I'm doing a signing or whatever, I usually get that question. You know, can you do what Janie does? And well, you know, I can't <laughs> go into anybody else's dream, but the techniques that she uses are. Uh, legitimate techniques, and, and I usually encourage kids to give it a try sometime. Was there anything that you learned in your research that changed the direction of the book or the story? Um, 
I can't say that there was. Um, that's a really good question. I'd have to think back to a few years. <laughs> but nothing's coming to mind. All right. <laughs> Sorry about um, that. That was, no, 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 it's okay. that was a really good question, though. That, that opens up some thoughts here. Yeah. Well, and you mentioned, you know, you, you, know, you encourage uh, young people who come see you to, to try some of these things. Um, do people come to you uh, and expect you to be an expert on dreams, and do they want to tell you all their dreams and, you know, that kind of thing? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I I have listened to a lot of people's dreams since this the first book came out, and I just think that's really fascinating. I think you know a, a lot of times dreams are very personal and meaningful to to us, and to share them with somebody, you know, it's not such a flip thing. It's it's really sort of a personal moment, and I've, I'm very flattered that people uh, feel comfortable sharing some of their private moments with me. I think that's really kind of cool, actually. Um, and I hope that other people can use their dreams to further their own writing um, and their own careers, you know, and, and solving problems. Like I was talking about a minute ago, a lot of times when I'm working on a new book and I get stuck and I feel like I've written myself in a corner, I do try and, and dream about the characters and the situation or whatever. And, and uh, that often is the answer to uh, fixing some of those things. It's pretty cool. Now, any of those fans who tell you their, <coughs> pardon me, their dreams, any of them ever wind up inadvertently frightening you? <laughs> Well, sure. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, I've had a few situations where um, things felt a little like they crossed some sort of line, and, and that happens, I think, to all authors at different points. And, um, you know, but for the most part, 95% of the time, it's um, very appropriate, and it's a fun discussion. I can just kind of hear it at the over the loudspeaker at Barnes and Noble. Security, security, to Miss McMahon's table, please. Security. <laughs> we got a 451 in progress. Security. Sorry. Um, hopefully uh, that doesn't happen. Hopefully not so not. far. Not so far. Hopefully not. Hopefully not when you're uh, here in Tampa at the uh, Inkwood Bookstore in uh, late February, where hopefully we'll get to we'll get to meet. Um, yes, I hope so. I'm looking forward to that. Definitely looking forward to that here. Um, I, I, you know, I'm trying to figure out some of the appeal of the book because, I mean, dreams, dream interpretation, which we're sort of touching on, it can be very uncomfortable for a lot of people, both their dreams, then when they start thinking about it, then they make the mistake of telling someone their dreams, and then someone else is telling them what it means. Um, and yet, kind of like a good car wreck, we, we really want to peek in. You know, We want to see it going on. Definitely, definitely. I think there is, you know, somewhat of a voyeuristic thing going on there. Um, but, uh, you know, th as far as the appeal, I think, it's, there's, I think it's more than just the dream aspect. I think that Janie probably appeals to a lot of people like, you know, different other, like other characters who are down and out appeal to people like Charlie in the chocolate factory. You know, he's mm -hmm. this poor kid who's got nothing. His dad works in the toothpaste factory and you know, they it's his birthday coming up and everybody, you know, the big present is one bar of chocolate from the whole family and you know, the grandparents are sleeping in the in the bed together and <laughs> they all live together and it's just <laughs> it's just this you feel so sorry for him, but you're so glad because he's worse off than you are. And I think that is very appealing to teenagers, too, because life is tough when you're a teenager. And if you can read about somebody whose life is a little bit worse than yours, it makes things feel a little bit better. Now, one of the things that is in, uh, is in the, the Wake series that is not in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory is... Uh, S-E-X. Um, <laughs> I'm so shocked to discover that T 
teens are thinking about sex all the time. I know. Uh, you're shocked. I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> I know not my kid, but maybe all right, those right. other kids. Yeah. yeah um, has, that, <laughs> has that been a... Do you, you know, uh, has that been an issue at all? Uh, have you heard from any parents who, you know, their kid's been reading this and then suddenly they pick it up and they go, oh, my God. Yes, I have. I've heard from <laughs> some parents. That's an odd answer. Well, you know, I think, um, I think that does happen um, whenever there's a controversial topic like that. Um, when I was a kid, my mother discovered I was reading a Judy Bloom book and – she found it in my backpack in the middle, or not, it felt like the middle of the night. It was like 11 o'clock at night. Woke me up and yelled at me, and then she threw it in the trash, and it was a big, terrible thing, and that's probably why I wrote, I write S-E-X in my books now. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, you know, it, uh, I definitely hear from people occasionally, but again, just like the appropriate people with telling me their dream stories it's just a very small percentage and mm. um you know i i i stand by as a parent of a 16 year old and a 13 year old i i trust my kids and i believe that my kids will put something down if they don't like it and if and we talk about the books they're reading all the time so if i can do that you know with my busy schedule i think other parents should be able to do that too the world is such a different place. I remember being uh, Rachel's age, my 13-year-old, and reading any book, because I'd read, I was just a ravenous reader. I'd read anything my mother left lying around, which in 1973, 74, there were a lot of Harold Robbins books, you know, the Carpetbaggers, the Pirates, uh, all kinds of, uh, 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 Joan Collins' sister, I can't think of her name off the top of my head all of a sudden, but, um, you know, really racy adult stuff, and here, here I am being a total. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm just looking. Oh, was there sex in the book my daughter's reading? No. Whereas <laughs> I was reading at that age, I was reading. You know, I mean, I subscribed to Playboy at 13. It's just such a different. It's such a different age, you know. Uh, I can't it is. really explain it. Uh, it's very but, yeah, interesting I mean, to look back at that because there wasn't back in that time period in, in that time period as if it's so so long ago um there really wasn't young adult there 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 wasn't a section in the in the in the bookstore called young adult you know oh. there was the catcher in the rye and that was shelved with the adult books but it was about a 15 year old so things are have changed in that area too, there's a whole new section, and it's really, really growing. The young adult uh, section of the of the stores is one of the few things that's growing right now in, in books. So, and, uh, it, it is a different. Our, our friend and agent is stocking a whole shelf or two of them. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> yes. Why did Why did uh, Janie Hannigan turn out to be a teen as opposed to an adult? Did you I mean Did you start out in mind thinking, oh young adult story, or did, did that just kind of come with the territory as you, as you kept writing? No, she was definitely a teen in my head uh, from the beginning. Um, and I think that's probably because teens are really interesting. Adult, adults mm. are kind of boring, and teenagers <laughs> are very, very interesting, and they're angsty, and they're... You know, there's all there's so much changing going on physically, emotionally, and that just gives you so much more to write about. And I think it's such an interesting time. Um, so I just, yeah, I, I mean, I, I <laughs> sometimes I think, you know, there's there's like two kinds of people. There's the the people who really loved. Uh, you know, at school and, and being a teenager and middle school especially, which is one of the hardest times of life. Um, and then there's the people who won't even remember anything that happened during that time. They won't bring it back up. They don't want to talk about it. Hmm. So, uh, but yeah, you know, it's it's because it's such a 
roller coaster ride of an age group. So it's very interesting. Well, we're uh, amazingly getting close to the end of our time, and I, I, I have to ask you, uh, and congratulations. I, I know that in December you signed a four-book deal with Simon & Schuster. Uh, pretty, uh, pretty exciting stuff. Yeah, I'm very excited. I'm really excited to be uh, staying with Simon & Schuster and coming out with the new stuff. I've got a couple more books in the young adult line lined up. Um, and then I'm starting a new series for a slightly younger crowd uh, in the fantasy, dystopian sort of genre. So very excited mm-hmm. about those. So uh, Gone is officially released February 8th, right? Uh, the and ninth, actually, but yep. The I've ninth, I'm sorry. The stores already, yes. So. I don't know how they do that. but uh, And then when, when will the next book uh, come out? It, my next book is called Crier's Cross, and that comes out next spring, um, spring 2011. It's another paranormal young adult with a little romance going on. So I think that people who – and it's a, it's a standalone. It's not the start of a new series or anything. Uh, it's, it's quite creepy. I, I kind of <laughs> creeped myself out a little bit when I was writing uh, one of the sections there and – uh, so I, I, I would say it's a little creepier than the Wake trilogy. Um, okay. Yeah, <laughs> but also the uh, the love story is is quite warm. <laughs> okay. All right. So yeah. Well, uh, let me tell everybody you can find out more about Lisa McMahon's book tour and where when she might be in your city by going to her website. It's lisamcmahon.com, dot com. L I S A. M C M A N N dot com. Uh, across the top, there's a number of choices. If you click on tour, it'll bring you a page that lists all the cities and all the bookstores starting February 9th in Tempe, Arizona at uh, Changing Hands Bookstore. And uh, all the way on through, let's see, where's the one where you and I are going to meet in person? Uh, Thursday, February 25th at Inkwood Bookstore. That's a uh, my friend Carla uh, has, uh, has that store. And uh, also, you should know, if you can't make it to the store, but you live in that, neighbor, in, in that community, uh, Lisa has a nice note on her site that says, if you would like personalized or signed copies of my books but can't make it to a signing, call one of the stores the day before the event to see if they'll take your order and ship it to you. Most stores are more than happy to do this for a nominal fee. So she's looking out for you. So get out there and buy that book. Buy all three if you haven't read them yet, by the way. Um, and uh, so you can find Lisa's new book, Gone. It's the third and final installment in the Janie Hannigan Wake trilogy in great bookstores everywhere, some of which I just mentioned, or you can order it online at mrmedia.com. And as I say, check out Lisa's website, lisamcmahon.com. And you can follow Lisa, before I forget, on Twitter, MySpace, Facebook, Goodreads, and who knows where else. There's probably some dream site that's uh, devoted to her at this point, too. Um, Lisa, it was great fun to have you on the show, great fun to discover your work and uh, the common threads, and thanks so much for coming on Mr. Media today. Thank you so much, and give Rachel my love. I will. Best of luck. See you soon. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. And folks, for more interviews with your favorite novelists, you can surf over to our main website, www.mrmedia.com. That's where you can listen to my earlier conversations with Sarah Zarr, James Dashner, Richard Deutsch, Monty Schultz, P- Peter Gollenbach, uh, John Darton, Sue Ann Jafarian, James Sheehan, and many more. And subscribe to Mr. Media on iTunes, and you'll never miss a show. Just search Mr. Media Interviews from within iTunes and subscribe for free. You can also listen with a piece of string and a tin can in many locations. If you've got an idea for a guest, email me directly at bob at andelman.com. You can also follow me on Facebook or on Twitter www.twitter.com slash Andelman. Thanks so much for joining us today. Always appreciate when you give a piece of your day and come spend it with us. Thanks for listening, everybody. <laughs>